I'm Janice Edwards. Coming up on Signature Silicon Valley, we're starting off our show talking with expert entrepreneur and now best-selling author Tony Navy. Then we'll have information about the Black Enterprise Tech Connect Summit, and we are going to talk about diversity STEM acceleration. Plus, if you're facing the holidays and wondering how to get through them, the Center for Living with Dying has tips that will help you and help your loved ones. It's a big show. It's coming up. Join us. <music> Welcome to Signature Silicon Valley. I'm Janice Edwards. Thank you for joining us. Tony Navy is someone who helps other people figure out how to get noticed. She's known for helping people craft their power pitch, and she's now a best-selling author, a contributing author to Voices of Inspiration, and we are inspired because Tony is with us today. How are you? Welcome. Very well, thanks. How are you? Thanks for having me. Oh, certainly. It's my pleasure. Well, I, you know, I started with a little bit about what you do, but that really doesn't encompass how you help people People get in touch with their genius, their talent, and move things forward. So tell us a little bit about how you do that. Well, I'm a business strategy expert, so the real deal is I actually help entrepreneurs and leaders with innovative strategies to run a profitable and high-performing business. But what I do is focus on giving them trainings, whether it's online or live, in four key areas. And so that's what I call the four P's of business success, yes. your plan, your people, and the processes that drive profitability. So for me, helping people connect with their genius, it's always in those four areas, because whether they're on the job or whether they're building a business it's the people around you how you get things done and just being able to look at ways to generate results so I get a chance to coach folks and I get a chance to take them through some of my programs to give them the right strategies and I think more so for themselves or their business but it's all about focusing on what will help them to be successful and that's so important because as you were talking I was thinking about this in the seven habits of that they talk about sharpening the saw and how sometimes someone can be so busy just doing something that they never stop yeah. to sharpen the saw like someone cutting a tree and if you just take that time to work with an expert instead of saying well I've just got to keep going in my business, you can just work smarter mm -hmm. instead of harder. What do you find is the biggest obstacle when you, if there's a common one, that people face when they, they've made the decision, okay, I want to do things differently. I want my business to be more successful. Tony, I'm coming to you for help. What's the biggest obstacle they usually have to overcome to really get into the zone of effectiveness? I think it's getting past themselves, right, mm -hmm. and actually making a decision to take action. You know, once they can get their, you know, that, that mindset, that mindset, I should say, just to shift so that they can actually start moving forward, it's just getting them to put their, you know, preconceived notions out of the way so that I can get them taking action and even little bits of time, you know, used faithfully every single day, we do what's called a power hour. Mm -hmm. And we do those and really look at ways to accomplish, you know, what they're trying to achieve. That's the biggest thing, that's the challenge, is getting their mindset out of the way but helping them move forward. What do you do during a power hour? A power hour is all about, here's what we want to achieve, here's the project that we want to go after, and especially for an entrepreneur, um, it's keeping them focused on that one thing until we get it systematized to start making money. Then we can focus on other things, but you know how entrepreneurs are, right? Mm -hmm. It's, we've got so many things going, you want to do everything, you start all these projects and you don't finish them. None of that. Power hours are designed to say, here's our project in this hour, or what I would call a power hour squared, in this hour you get 10, 10 minutes break in between, but in that two hours back to back, you are focusing on nothing but actions that really help that one project get accomplished, but you get it to start making money first before you start doing anything else. Wow, that's exciting dynamic, and even as you were talking, I could imagine the resistance coming in because people then, have to face themselves, or we have to face yes. ourselves, I should say, <laughs> when it comes to looking at those things. A lot of times, even with a dream and mm -hmm. an idea of success, when you actually are confronted with the opportunity for that to change and your life to transform, yeah. resistance comes up. Why is that? I feel, even for myself, you know, when I look at my own self in the mirror, many times it's fear. 
Mm. Right? It's fear of being successful. It's the fear of changing or shifting and doing something different. It's the fear that people around you, the six degrees of separation, the people that are closest to you sometimes can be the people that are putting things in your ear that you can't accomplish something. And so that's one of the reasons why we break it down into an hour because if you can just do this for an hour, then it becomes much more achievable than this big, huge, grandiose goal. That's not what it's about. It's doing something and being successful even in that one hour each moment. And so that's the biggest challenge I find for myself and for the people that I work with. Yes, and it seems like it would be such a privilege to work with you. You <laughs> write in Voices of Inspiration in your chapter about being oh, wow. a janitor at Casual Corner, yes. which was a clothing store that I guess there's some still around, but not yeah. many, I don't yeah. think, but great store. You used to always go there for clothes, but, but you had an idea even behind that when you took that job. So you, you've always been a strategist. Always. Well, <laughs> since I was 10, I wanted to become an attorney. Mm -hmm. So my whole focus was everything about, you know, uh, Father Dowling, being on Perry Mason, being <laughs> able to, you know, I was too young, right, when I right. became the janitor. I was too young to work there, so I figured out how I could do whatever because the clothes made me look like the attorney. So it was, it was always this drive to do mm -hmm. something different and to right. do something better than where I am, you know, at the moment. And so that still sticks with me today. Right, and you, you decided not to become an attorney, but instead yes. you're helping others really fight their battles of life in the way with, with the processes that you share. Absolutely. What does it mean to you to have Voices of Inspiration, which is a book, and Marlon Smith, who's been, an yes. who's been a guest and is a dear friend, is also the, the visionary behind this book. But having this book become an, an Amazon number one bestseller, how was that for you? You know what, it's been fantastic because it just makes you recognize that it's a door opener, at least for me, to possibilities. You know, think of writing a book, it's like this arduous process. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, it's really not. When I hammered out the book, it, I realized, you know, Voices of Inspiration is so much more than just my chapter. It really was what has inspired me over the years. Yeah. It is what I teach, it is what I train, it is what I coach when I'm helping a professional. So I realized I have a lot inside being able to get it out and be a blessing to somebody else to help them achieve what they're trying to accomplish yeah. was just powerful for me. Well, congratulations on that. So when someone decides, I want to reach out, I want Tony to help me shape these things in my life to become better, at what stage should they be? Does it matter? It doesn't. Uh, you know, on the entrepreneur side of the house, I have people that haven't started their business yet, to people that have been building their business and they have leaders or CEOs that are, you know, executives, to that professional that's just starting out looking for a job or, you know, they've been seasoned and, or they are seasoned in their position and they're looking to completely switch careers. So for me, it's just finding that person and being able to say, they're really the same kinds of things that you need to do. You're just at different stages in your, jo in your job on the what I would call a career continuum yes. or different stages in your business as a leader or as a, you know, basically an entrepreneur trying to build their business to the next level. The principles of success pretty much stay the same. Wow, well, you're inspirational. And I think at this time of year, when people are winding down in many ways, it's wonderful to tune it up and yes. get ready, not just for the new year, but a new life, new practices, new experiences, new excitement. So thank Thank you, Tony, very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd like to contact Tony Navy, details are on our screen. And again, the book is Voices of Inspiration. The holiday season is often a time of joyous celebration, yet for some, the memories of lost loved ones can make it a time that is difficult to navigate. The Center for Living with Dying has an opportunity to share tips that can make a difference, and we wanted to help you enjoy the holidays with this information. We are here with Janet Childs and she is amazing. We always love talking with her and especially wanted to get together to talk about help during the holiday season. So we'll have part one today and part two in our next show. Janet's title is Director of Education and Training Critical Incident Stress Management for the Center for Living with Dying, a, a program of the Bill Wilson Center. I wanted to make sure we get that right because your programs are so important. The support in the community is so important. And Janet, it's great to see you again. Thank you for taking time to talk with us. It is wonderful to be here and we have been doing a much in our community. Things have been very busy and especially as we approach the holiday season, I believe it's so important 
to give people tools for coping because it can be a very intense time. Yes, absolutely. And one of the reasons that I always like to make sure we talk with you is we first met after 9-11 and you had done some work with especially Alice Hoagland, whose son was on Flight U 9 at 93. That's right. And then when my mom passed, you were so helpful mm. with me with sharing the importance of ritual and just dealing with grief. And so at whatever stage you are right now, even if you think, oh, I'm fine, but you want some information, you want to share with someone else, the tips that Janet has can be very useful. We also want to say you have a couple of support programs people can come out to. There's one on November 18th. We'll put that information up and then another one on December 9th. So those are resources and opportunities to come together. When we talk about the holidays and we look at the fact that there's so much joy around this, you say that there's also a reason that that's when grief comes up. Can you explain a little bit about why that becomes present at a time where most people are saying, just enjoy life? Exactly. And that's what the message that we normally get. Because holidays are what we call anniversary triggers, mm -hmm. and there are three kind of, kinds of triggers we can get in grief. One is sensory triggers, the sights, the sounds, the smells, you know, yes. the textures, the, you know, all of yes. those around the holidays are intensified because they connect us to memories, mm -hmm. okay, which can, brings us to our memory triggers. Anniversary triggers are any special day. So the day of the death, you know, the day the person might have been born, mm -hmm. you know, any special holiday that we celebrated whether it be, you know, 4th of July, Thanksgiving, whether it be, you know, uh, a special religious or spiritual holiday, you know, Easter, Christmas, you know, Rosh Hashanah, right. whatever, when we celebrate that particular day, it brings into sharp focus that we no longer have our loved one with us. And we have memories that are about that loved one that are intensified during that time. So we actually prepare for the holidays when we are grieving we start to dread them mm -hmm. like about a week beforehand like four days yes. beforehand we start really gearing up because the body has those sensory memories and so yes. some schools yes. of thought are well just don't think about it because if you don't let your mind go there you won't experience it but you one of the reasons you say living with dying is the name of the wonderful programs that you do is because you want people to be able to tell the full truth about what they're feeling and still find the joy so what are some tips that can help people as they're preparing during the holiday season well one of the most important thing to do is to acknowledge I'm in grief this holiday this holiday is going to be different mm -hmm. than any other holiday Okay. It's not going to be the same, so I can't do things the same way. So think about planning for doing things a little bit differently. And letting and, that be okay. And letting that be okay. okay. For example, I worked with a couple whose son died by suicide, very mm -hmm. traumatic death, and they used to have him put up the lights on the Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. That was going to be very hard for them. So what they figured out to do was they got their son's friend to put on the ornaments Oh. And for her, the daughter, the, the son's sister, mm -hmm. to put on the lights. So they changed up the traditions a little bit, mm -hmm. so it made it a little bit easier. And then yes. they bought a special ornament in honor of their son and put it on the tree wow. all together as a family. Oh, that's beautiful. That brings tears to my eyes. And I, I think that that's it. It's saying, okay, we can do something. Yes. And let it be okay. Yes. Now, there are people who may not know how to support a loved one who's just gone through, lost the first anniversary, and they wonder, should I mention it or not? What do you recommend? We recommend that you do mention it because okay. it becomes like an elephant in the middle of the room and it creates discomfort because everyone's thinking about it, but no one's saying anything about it. Yes. So a gentle way would be to maybe say, you know, I know this probably this holiday season is going to be rough or this day might be rough. And, know that I'm thinking of memories of, uh, you know, loved ones. Uh, at a Thanksgiving dinner, we had an incredible experience where everyone lit a candle for their loved one who had died. So we had like several people together for Thanksgiving dinner. Wow. And then they would share a memory of that loved one, which lives in our hearts. Yes. So it became like a little ceremony of gratitude for the moments we had with them in life. But it acknowledged it so that it gave us a chance to cry, to laugh, to share memories. One yes. of my wonderful clients taught me a very powerful lesson. She was a homeless woman mm. and uh, she had gone through multiple losses. And she said, you know, Janet, my heart's like a hotel. 
and everybody I love has their own special room in my heart hotel. Oh. When they die, no one takes their room in my heart hotel. Oh. And the power of that is... That is powerful. Isn't it? Is yes. that we can add memories. As we share memories with each other, we can add memories to the Heart Hotel. Yeah, some people continue to live on. Exactly. Well, we're going to continue this conversation in our next show, but Janet, thank you so much. And here's a candle. You mentioned candles. Yes. And um, do you want to light this candle? And let me explain this beautiful candle. This was made by our volunteer counselors, mm. and we put a ribbon for every wish for our clients and oh. for grieving people in the world. Wow. And the crane is a gift from my brother. My brother died. Before he did, he taught me how to make the little origami I crane. when your brother passed. Yes. yes. Wow. So it's well, a wonderful is... symbology. And this is an example of a ceremony or ritual that we do at the Center for Living with Dying. Yes, well it's beautiful. And we want to let people know again about the information we talked about, that there are events coming up to support the Center for Living with Dying and to support each other at this time. The Black Enterprise Tech Connects Summit was an incredible success. If you weren't able to attend, here are some of the highlights. Last month, we gave you a preview of the Black Enterprise Tech Connects Summit. It was an incredible event. Derek Dingle is Senior Vice President and Chief Content Officer for Black Enterprise. And Derek, we want to take a little bit of time to talk about the history. I had the pleasure years ago of interviewing Earl Graves. And for people who never met Mr. Graves and don't know how the vision came about, give us a little bit of the history because you've been with Black Enterprise since 1987. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 been a it's been a great ride. Um, Earl Graves represents a generation of entrepreneurs that pretty much set the table for modern African American entrepreneurship. Uh, his history goes back to uh, Robert F. Kennedy. He was an administrative aide for Robert F. Kennedy, and in 1968, when the um, senator was unfortunately uh, assassinated, uh, Mr. Graves was looking for what he could do next. And he always had a focus on economic and entrepreneurial development for those who are underrepresented. So he started developing a um, initially a newsletter, and then he talked to some consultants, and they said this should be a magazine. And from there, we've created this platform to help African Americans start businesses, move up in their careers, and build wealth through investment and now we're expanding into such areas as technology, education, uh, where we have a focus on what we call um, Be Smart to bring in, you know, to create a pipeline of, uh, of new achievers. And then we've also started Women of Power and BE Modern Man to serve those segments and to make sure that we uh, create avenues for growth and development. It's wonderful. And you have the television now, you have all the venues. That's why it's yeah. content. How, how do, have you seen businesses change over the years since you've been involved with Black Enterprise? Oh, it's, it's amazing. When I started at Black Enterprise, we were a single publication company and we evolved with media. We went into heavily into websites when we had the emergence of digital. Now we have a vibrant social media area. We have two television shows, Women of Power and Our World with Black Enterprise. And an area that has been uh, expanding rapidly has been our event area. So we have our Black Enterprise Tech Connect Summit, but we also have the Black Enterprise Entrepreneur Summit, the Women of Power Summit. We also went into partnership with um, Film Life, and now we co-own America Black Film Festival. So all Incredible. of these areas serve different segments of the Black Enterprise audience, and also it helps drive this vibrant entrepreneurial community in different sectors. You, you can't have a one-size-fits-all strategy, so we created these vehicles to serve different segments of entrepreneurs and professionals. It is so dynamic and exciting, and going into the Tech Connect Summit. I know you had some goals. What do you hope people will have taken away from this experience? What I, what I hope we take away is one that there is a lot of uh, uh, valuable talent out there that needs to be brought into corporations as well as needs to gain the capital so that their ideas can flourish. Uh, in terms of the Tech to Connect attendees, we have entrepreneurs there that are going to create the next big thing that's going to change and revolutionize our society. Also, it gives us an opportunity 
to expose the world to African Americans that are at the highest level in the tech in technology sector. For example, we had uh, David Drummond of Google, you know, one of the most powerful men in technology globally. We had Mayor Kevin Johnson and how he is connecting Sa Sacramento and using technology to drive economic development and education. We had Tim Draper from Startup U as another access point to gain capital and entrepreneurship. And then we had we paid homage to Ken and Caritha Coleman yes, and to Roy Clay. Yes. And those were the trailblazers that some 30, 40 years ago helped kickstart uh, a generation of African Americans and people of color in technology. And we wanted to uh, show that from that point to today, we are still a vibrant force in that sector, and we will continue to be. Absolutely, you will continue to be. Well, thank you so much for bringing the summit to us and for all that Black Enterprise does. And we are excited about it. It was an honor to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Janice, for um, having us on your program and helping to make us part of the Silicon Valley community. Absolutely, you're putting your signature on the <laughs> Valley for Signature yeah. Silicon Valley. If you'd like to contact Black Enterprise, details are on our screen. Diversity STEM Accelerator is a new program that's designed to help boost diversity in the Valley. And we have the heads of the program right here with us today. Excited to have Charlotta Carter, who is the CEO and founder, Lakeisha Poole, who is the VP, and Lisa Riley, who's the secretary. Welcome, ladies. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Oh, glad to have you. Charlotta, tell me about this vision and how it became a reality. Well, uh, myself, I've always, in the Valley, I've, I, I'm a business owner myself, a staffing company, and I've worked in the Valley for over 30 years. And I've worked in staffing. Um, I've worked as a technologist at IBM. I've worked at Microsoft and Sun Microsystems. So I have a very, uh, very full background in diversity and diversity STEM and, and, and uh, just growing diversity uh, in a number of companies that I've worked with before. So having it come full, for, full uh, circle again uh, has been something of my dream. So we're just we're moving forward with it. It's very exciting. Most people know that STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math, but just want to emphasize that. And Lakeisha, how did you become involved? Uh, yes, I, I got, became involved through Charlotta, but also because I'm an employment lawyer, I have done work uh, for, I've been practicing for nine years and worked both plaintiff side and management side in employment law. And in doing so, I've learned a lot about different policies and how um, it, often in my experience working plaintiff side, a lot of the complaints are very reactionary, reactionary to discrimination that could be prevented through uh, diversity and inclusion measures. And I wanted to have a, uh, a way of uh, making that impact. Great, and Lisa, how about you? So I met Charlotta several years ago through the Black Recruiters Network, which was established here in Silicon Valley through a wonderful mutual friend Cynthia Wesley and uh, I'm a recruiter at a local corporation here in Santa Clara County and I hooked up with Charlotta again and she was sharing her passion with me and she was on fire and she <laughs> caught me on fire as well and so I was pulled in to volunteer and support the efforts in uh, working with corporations and African American talent and diverse talent in Santa Clara County. Well there's a lot of conversation these days about diversity but what does that look like in practicality? So when someone comes to you and has a need, how do you assess that and what kind of outcomes are you looking for? Well, if, if you look at uh, the, what does successful growth and diversity looks like, there are several layers. And so you really need to have a foundation where your executive is bought into it. If you don't have that, the rest of it is just noise. So if you've got, you got buy-in from the executive level, then you can start to build on your program as to you know, adding strategic programs. And then once you have started to look at adding strategic programs and then building a culture where a diverse uh, resource or diverse employee can thrive, the pipeline is very easy. The pipeline is never the issue. It's the buy-in from the top is strategic programs and it's the culture in which they can thrive. When you say the pipeline is never <coughs> the issue, the pipeline is the acceleration for promotion though, right? No, the, the pipeline is the, 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 um, oh, you mean just getting people just in? Just getting people in, you okay. know, that's always been the fallback, oh, we can't find those people. Right. That's never the issue. 
so if we do have, if you don't have buy-in, if you don't have strategic programs, if you don't have a nurturing environment, putting people through the pipeline, they'll just fall through and they'll leave the company. So you've got to have those layers in there, and that's really the approach that we talk to companies about is this is the best way to approach growing it successfully long term. And are companies becoming more receptive to that now? It's because you're, you're approaching it in a positive way, companies understand it better and they understand that it's, it's a positive thing for the growth from, from a market share perspective, from a community perspective, and from the, in, and the economic perspective. So when you look at the positives, people understand it. Uh, and not necessarily like beating them over the head with it. It's like, th it's a good thing for everybody. Yes. Okay. Lakeisha, you were mentioning that a lot of times when there are complaints, there are different ways to handle them. Can you give an example of one that you've encountered? A complaint in an employment context? Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I handle cases and I represent employees and, and in terms of uh, how companies handle issues, a lot of times uh, what I, my perspective being a plaintiff's attorney, uh, you know, is that there is a refusal to, to see the side of the other, of the employee and address some of the systemic issues for that employee. I think that the nature of diversity, when it becomes a matter of compliance, it's not innovative, it's not empathetic, and it's not uh, forward-looking. And so what happens is there's an entrenchment in the position of we're defending the company and we're right, as opposed to, okay, well, maybe there's a position that we can at least come to and there are policy changes that can make the environment more inclusive. So there, I think what it is is a problem of perspective, not having the perspective of the employee that's complaining and and not willing to make changes to make that environment more inclusive. Yeah. Lisa, you've worked in the Valley for a number of years now. What do you hope will come from people who come to Diversity STEM Accelerators? How will they be, how will they benefit and how will the Valley therefore benefit from the work that you all are doing? We want to educate the corporations, we want to educate individuals, empower them to be successful to have the confidence and develop skills to go and work for these wonderful companies like a Google or a Facebook or LinkedIn. And so we want to help them get to that level, build their skill sets, grow their confidence, teach them how to negotiate a salary or offer, and be competitive with everyone else for those corporations and those jobs. And in terms of the fees for the services? Uh, we have graduated fees. It's based on uh, each company has a, a certain need, so it would definitely it'd be a customized fee working with. And then they're small companies, they're large companies, they're medium-sized companies. So we work with you know each company to figure out what's the best fee for them. Yeah, so it really speaks to an esprit de corps, which is something that a lot of times when people hear about diversity, like you said, they feel like it's being forced on them as opposed mm -hmm. to this really benefits everyone and it's, it's a reality. Absolutely. Even with small numbers in Silicon Valley, diversity is certainly important. Right. It matters, yes. Well, thank you so much for the work that you're doing. It's thank exciting. You. Congratulations yes. on yeah, launching you. this nonprofit thank and we you. look forward to great success and continuing to see your signature on our Valley in big ways. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so thank much. You. Thanks for having us. Certainly, yeah. my pleasure. If you'd like to contact Diversity STEM Accelerator, details are on our screen. Also, there'll be information about their fundraiser on the website. The website is there. So thanks again. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's our show. I'm Janice Edwards. Thank you for putting your signature on our valley and for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time. Please join us next.